I'm Heather Pekoski, Marketing Manager at HireRight. Thank you for joining our webinar, Detecting Drug Use in the Workplace, Facts and Best Practices. Before we get started, I need to go over a few housekeeping items. The audio for this webinar can be heard through your computer. There isn't a conference call number. Tomorrow, everyone who registered for this webinar will receive a link to the recording of this event and the presentation slides. The presentation slides are also available now through the resource widget at the bottom of your screen. This webinar has been pre-approved for one general recertification credit hour towards PHR, SPHR, and GPHR through the HR Certification Institute. Registrants of this event who attend the entire event will receive an email tomorrow with the information required to redeem credit. Today's presentation is for informational purposes only. Should you have any legal questions, please direct them to your legal counsel. To help orient you with our webinar environment, I wanted to draw attention to the widget bar at the bottom of your screen. This bar controls all components of the webinar, including help, which provides troubleshooting tips for technical issues, slides to bring the slides into view, audio controls, which allows you to adjust the volume, resources where you can access additional resources, and also download the presentation outline of the slides. Q&A Ask Question, this is where you can submit questions that, will we, that we will answer at the end of the presentation as time permits. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, please let us know through this icon and someone will assist you. Speaker biography, and then most importantly, press F5 if your screen or your audio isn't refreshing. Today's presenter is Dr. Todd Simo, Chief Medical Officer. Dr. Simo is a licensed physician and board certified medical review officer, and he oversees the drug and health screening program at Higher Right. He completed his medical training at the University of Minnesota and has served as a Navy medical officer. His vast experience and training spans family, occupational, and addiction medicine. If you have questions about drug and health testing, Dr. Simo can answer them. So without further ado, Dr. Simo. Well, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, I wish you didn't have the picture there because, uh, as everyone tells me, I, I really have a, a, you know, a, a face that is much better over the phone than it is in person. Uh, but that being said, you know, I'd like to, you know, spend, you know, the next uh, about an hour with everyone on the phone just talking about, you know, the drug, drug and health screening, particularly drug-free workplace programs. So whenever I look at drug-free workplace programs, I like to put everything into kind of a historical perspective. So, you know, what happened and what were the generators that led us to this, the environment that we uh, live in today? You know, as we're doing that, we should look at the drug screening specimens because there's, there's three uh, major specimens out there used for testing, and really what is that ideal specimen? And why was, you know, urine actually originally chosen for it? And then we can look at some trends, and what we're going to look at is trends in urine positive rate over the last, you know, well over a decade, what's happening with that number, why are there alternate specimens? Because if urine was the right specimen in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, why did people even develop alternate specimens out there? And then we're going to get much, you know, more specific in regards to, hey, in, in the, you know, 21st century here, you know, what is really the best program? What you know, each one of the uh, specimens have their strengths and weaknesses, and as as the evolution of the industry evolved, many of our, our client programs have, and many of the people who are you have drug-free workplace programs in place haven't evolved. So we're really going to look at specimen and selection, and, and potentially which specimen is best for you know your particular organization. So from a history lesson perspective, there was really two watershed events uh, that happened uh, in the 1980s during the Reagan administration. The first was a crash of, a, of an airplane on the carrier USS Nimitz. And, and during that accident where a pilot crashed upon landing, you know, 14 sailors and Marines were killed. There were 48 injured. There were seven planes destroyed, 11 planes damaged. And the estimated cost of that accident was well over $150 million. 
So uh, the Navy came through and investigated uh, that incident. When they investigated on autopsy, they actually found that the six of the sailors killed actually had marijuana uh, in their system. Uh, and that drugs were a contributing factor to the accident itself. Uh, this event led the Reagan administration to, to vigorously look at the U.S. military drug screening regulations and process and make marked changes in that to, to uh, conform to a drug-free workplace. So coming out of the Vietnam War, there was quite a few people in the military that you were using drugs on a routine basis. Uh, the military, due to this watershed event, really looked at itself introspectively and decided to have a much more rigorous testing program that was born out of this incident across all the branches of the military. Well, during the same administration in 1987, there was a Maryland uh, train accident. This accident, oftentimes referred to as the Conrail accident, was that a, a train, an Amtrak passenger train, was stopped due to traffic uh, on the railways outside of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Conrail was, uh, train was moving along, and the, both the engineer and brakeman uh, failed to heed all the numerous warnings signals that they needed to slow down, and that train plowed into the Amtrak passenger train, killing 14 passengers and two Amtrak em employees, and at that point in time, uh, it was the deadliest play, uh, uh, train crash to date. It's been subsequently replaced by a train crash in Alabama, but again, it was a huge event. During the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board's investigation of this, it was found that both the engineer and brake operator on the Conrail train had been found to be smoking marijuana. And the NTSB cited that the probable cause of the accident was actually that marijuana use. That event in and of itself uh, then caused the you know, Reagan administration to push through the 1991 Omnibus Transportation Act. And that, that is really the mandatory testing for federally regulated employers. So what we're looking at, you know, our urine was the specimen that they chose uh, for drug testing. Breath was the specimen used for alcohol testing, and really deterrence was the goal. What the, what the Reagan administration wanted to do with the 1991 tra you know, Transportation, Omnibus Transportation Act was to basically say, hey, you know, people who are in, you know, regulated by DOT operate large pieces of equipment that put the general public at risk if they don't operate them safely. Therefore, we are going to, you know, uh, have a drug-free workplace in place to, uh, to foster a, an environment of deterrence. So people who want to go into these jobs need to be drug-free. So that was really the intent. It was a deterrence-based program. And those are two, uh, two pictures there, one of the Nimitz on fire after the crash, and the other incidence is actually the Conrail crash in Maryland. So from a history leven, uh, lesson perspective, once uh, you know, drug screening became more mainstream, late 80s, early 90s, uh, U.S. Department of you know, Labor and U.S. Chamber of Commerce did quite a few studies during that period of time to find out what the impact of drug use was and what the impact of that drug use was to employers. So when we start looking at direct costs of drug use to employers, the studies are very clear, and they've been reproduced several times. But a drug, a drug abusing employee is, it has three, you know, three times the medical care costs as, as their peers. So, you know, one of your drivers of medical care costs are people illicitly using drugs. Illicit drug use, you know, they're five times more likely to have a workman compensation claim. So again, they're getting injured more often, they're seeking more workman comp care, and the more workman comp care and claims that you have, the higher those rates are. And then another part, you know, is really the illegal drug use uh, diverting money from legitimate businesses, and that could be as much as $100 billion a year. So a huge number uh, is being diverted from, you know, your companies in terms of 
lost freight where people are taking it and selling it to support their drug use. Um, finance people rearranging account numbers to all of a sudden sift money out to support their drug use. These are all ways that, that you know, these diversion techniques happen. So when we go to the next one, which is more indirect costs, you know, the illicit drug user only works at 67% of their ultimate capability. So that person who, if, you know, uh, is, is working, if they weren't using drugs, they'd even be a better worker. Uh, one of the reasons they're at 67% of their, uh, you know, capacity is due to absenteeism. So when you start looking at that, they're three times, you know, uh, three times more likely to be late for work and have two and a half times more absences. So you're looking at that these people don't show up to work on time, they are absent more often, and there was a U.S. Department of Labor study that says collectively substance abusers have an absentee rate of 30 to 35 business days a year. So you're looking at over a month worth of work is lost due to them just being absent, and the absence is caused by their drug addiction and the medical problems that that drug addiction causes. The next bullet point really is, uh, is a third to a half of working with comp claims are related to substance abuse. And, you know, alcohol and alcoholism, you know, accounts for about 40, you know, 40 percent of industrial fatalities and almost half the industrial uh, injuries can be tracked back or linked to, to alcohol abuse or alcoholism dependence. So when you take all those studies together and you kind of, you know, mash the numbers and, and analyze it, you know, what the U.S. Department of Labor came out with and several other bodies during the 90s was several different figures, but they all trended to a range of around $11,000 per year in 1990 dollars that it cost uh, a company to have a, a drug abuser employed. So again, that's a big number. It's a big number today, let alone in 1990, it was even a larger number. But that's a number that I'll be using through this presentation to, call, you know, as the cost avoidance. So if you detect a drug, a person that is using drugs, you either rehabilitate them through your employee's assistance program or you remove them from employment. That's the number that I'm going to be using as the economic impact uh, of illicit drug use. So, the drug screening specimen. So what is the ideal specimen out there? Well, the, the characteristics of that ideal specimen are, are, are fairly e easy to elaborate. The first one, it has to be easy to collect and transport. You don't want to be uh, collecting biohazardous samples that then need to go, uh, you know, and be shipped to the lab. You don't have to have a bunch of protocols in place with your transit companies to get, you know, blood or something else there. So it has to be easy to collect and easy to transport. It has to be relatively inexpensive to test. So you have to have, you know, uh, good ways to test it, and that testing can't cost hundreds of dollars to get done. You need to have something much uh, less expensive. The testing has to be accurate. So everything you do when, when there is a laboratory confirmed test, you don't want to have this uh, false positive sense out there. And in fact, the, what they ended up you know, putting in place, there is truly no laboratory false positive tests or, or, or so close to zero, it, it's zero. Because all the laboratory tests in this type of arena are done through very specific chromatographic and mass spectrometry testing. And therefore, it's very specific to a given drug. So they, again, have to be accurate. You do have to have an adequate window of detection. So when, you, when they looked at that, they said, hey, what can we need to detect for not just what happened in the last hour. We want to have a window of detection that is at least several days, and then impossible to subvert. You don't want the people, people being able to game the specimen and be able to all of a sudden, you know, beat the test just by doing something that subverts the testing process. Well, in the late 80s, early 90s, urine checked all of those boxes. Urine actually is very easy to collect. 
It's easy to transport. It's a stable specimen. It is not a biohazard. It, it's cheap to test, relatively cheap to test. It's already in liquid phase. The labs knew how to already test urine as a specimen. They had very accurate and codified testing procedures in place. The detection window for urine is generally drug use within the last week, but it, it's several days, two, three, four days. So they said, hey, that's an adequate detection window. And in the late 80s, no one was really subverting the urine test. So there wasn't good ways to subvert the urine test. So it hit all of those marks in regards to being the ideal specimen at that point in time. So re really, what's happened since the late 80s? So Quest Diagnostics, uh, one of our laboratory partners here at Higher Right, is, is gracious enough to provide us analytic data year over year. So Dr. Barry Sample uh, compiles this data for Quest and publishes it. It's, it's freely available to everyone on what's called the Quest Diagnostics Drug Testing Index. So I took you know, uh, you know, his data and graphed it out here. But when they started tracking this data in the late 80s, almost 14% of the urine specimens sent to the lab were positive. Well, you can see as the trend line goes through the 90s, there's a rapid decrease year over year, and then it, it kind of plateaus out and has kind of dipped below 4% over the last just over a decade. So, big positive rate, late 80s, rapid diminishing rate in the 90s, and now it's at a, a fairly flat rate over the last decade of being under 10%, or under 4%, excuse me. And then when you look at that, well, let's look at what the last decade showed. The last decade, when we look at the Quest data, and then we compare that to the NIDA data, and NIDA is an acronym uh, for the National Institute of, of Drug Abuse. NIDA is, is part of the Department of Human Health Services. But NIDA sends out you know, um, questionnaires every year to, to huge groups of people. And what they're asking in those questionnaires are, do you, you know, do you, have you used within the last year an illicit substance? Do you use, within the last month, have you used an illicit substance? So they're asking questions like that, and when they'll compile that data when it comes in. So when you look at year over year over the last decade, you're actually seeing a slight increase over the last decade of people self-reporting illicit drug use. Now, some of the increase here over the last you know, few years has been marijuana. More, more people, especially younger people, are, are admitting to marijuana use. But the percentage of people reporting drug abuse and what the labs are actually detecting is well under a half of that. So, you know, in 2012, you have 9.2% 9 9 of the general public saying, yeah, I've abused drugs within the last month. But then from a laboratory you know, confirmed positive rate, it's only 3.5%. So something is causing the difference between the two. So what is this? What's really changed over the last 20 years? Well, there's, there's two, two schools of thought, whether it's deterrence, that people who are going in for drug, drug screens, if you're using illicit drugs, you just don't do that. You don't seek employment with an employer that has a drug-free workplace program in place. There are several employers out there that don't have any such program, and therefore people will self-select. If you all of a sudden look at the, the, the food and beverage industry, so restaurants and such, the self-reported rate of drug use in those industries is in the double digit. They, they're, they're sitting around 10 to 12 percent of people, up, upwards to 15 percent of people saying, hey, yeah, I use drugs routinely. And part of the reason that they select that as their career of choice is because there's no drug-free workplace program in place at many of those employers. But you also have people that are subverting the test. So you have people that are Department of Transportation covered employees for motor carriers, busing companies, railroads, uh, airlines. And what they're doing there is, is they're trying to subvert the test. 
So again, deterrence is certainly a factor that it has worked to deter. There are several studies out there that show once you put a drug-free workplace program in place, you reduce your absenteeism, you reduce your workman comp claims, you actually reduce your medical care costs. So there's several of those things. So we know that deterrence works and it empowers and you know, people to make better choices. And again, drug seekers just seek jobs that are people who don't drug test. But again, subversion is also a factor. You know, literally, if you go to Google and Google beat the drug test, you will literally find millions of sites out there that are devoted to beating the drug test. The vast majority of those sites are to beat the urine drug test. And the categories of how you beat the drug test are dilution, adulteration, and substitution. So just look at that from a urine positive rate perspective and the, the rapid decrease over the 90s and what also is happening over the 90s? Well, Al Gore created the internet, uh, according to him. So, you know, the internet came about. And what the internet has allowed us to do is disseminate information over broad amounts of people very rapidly. You know, I'm old enough to remember the day where if I had to get you know, current information, I had to go to a library and, and go to the magazine aisle and get, you know, those, that type of information there. I had to go read the paper on a daily basis to get information. Well, now all of us carry around all the information that we would ever need in all likelihood through our, through our cell phone. So, you know, we're looking at during that period of time, there was people elaborating how to beat the urine drug test. So there were several, there's again, several million sites out there. And since the urine specimen is not observed as a standard, there's a lot of ways that it can then be manipulated. There are only a few instances that urine drug strains are actually collected in an observed setting. You know, in those instances, some of them are mandated by the federal regulations. Some of them are recommended by the medical review officer, and there's actually four states, you know, Connecticut, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, and Maine that don't allow you to observe unless it is a federal employee. So, so again, from the manipulation techniques, what adulteration means is the donor is placing something in their urine specimen that then changes what's in that specimen. So those are oxidizing materials or thing, you know, substances that go in there and change the environment, and that environment breaks up the evidence of marijuana or cocaine in, in it. And there's actually very technically sophisticated drugs that do that, that go in there, break up them, you know, oxidize the marijuana metabolite, and after oxidizing the marijuana metabolite, there's something else that comes in and, so to speak, oxidizes that sample or, or neutralizes that so that when the laboratory gets the specimen, they don't even know there was anything foreign in it. The next is substitution, and substitution is actually using another fluid, and, and then the donor says, well, that was my urine. So the different ways uh, of substitution is getting a family member or friend to urinate in the cup for you and bringing their urine in instead of your own. But there are also even more advanced ways of doing it that, you know, on the Internet today, you can go out and ask for synthetic urine, and if you Google that, you will find a plethora of sites that you can buy synthetic urine off the Internet and have it shipped to your home. And that synthetic urine meets all of the physical characteristics of urine, and the lab can't say it's not urine through its normal screening techniques. And there's also freeze-dried urine. There was a gentleman in, in South Carolina who made well over a million dollars a year selling certified drug-free urine on the Internet. Um, when the federal government tried to close down his website, that's when they discovered he was making over a million dollars a year, and he never disclaimed any of it on income tax, so now he's in prison. But nonetheless, there's a huge market for that. And then the last is really dilution. So these are things that when you go to GNC and you see body sanitizers or uh, such, these are things that are natural diuretics that, that increase the amount of water in your urine naturally. And the more water in your urine, the less concentrated it is, the less concentrated it is, the less likely the labs are going to detect drug, drugs because all of those drugs are detected based upon concentration.
So again, these are ways that, in, you know, by yourself in the bathroom that are ways that you can then manipulate that specimen to give you a more favorable result. So here is actually a, a, an example of this. So, uh, you know, Washington State did a study in 2002 that was looking at the trucking company, uh, trucking industry. So they set up uh, Operation Trucker Check that was uh, in truck stops in Washington State. Uh, they, they basically had people come in and uh, they wanted to inspect their vehicle for safety. But they, the big thing there was is to then also collect an anonymous drug screen. And just as a reference point, in 2002, all drug screens at Quest, not federally regulated drug screens because they didn't provide the granularity of data back then, but it was a 4.4% positive rate. I was a board certified MRO during this period of time. The positive rate I was appreciating in the federal screening area was about 2.5%. So taking those numbers into consideration, um, you know, about 20% of the uh, drivers said, no, nah, I don't want to do this. But a, a, a fair number percent, you know, 80% plus said, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and submit a urine sample because they were incentivized to present it, to give a urine sample because they got like a soda or a free drink if they, if they gave an anonymous sample. Well, when they actually did that, the positive rate for stimulants such as methamphetamine and amphetamine and cocaine and such was almost 10%. So 10% of the specimens were positive for a stimulant. 4.3% of the you know, specimens were positive for marijuana metabolite. So it showed this po outrageously high positive rate where they were expecting the positive rate more to be consistent with what Quest saw at under, around 4% or under 4% for federally regulated testing. And really, this is clipped and pasted right out of that article. The results indicate that in spite of a comprehensive drug you know, drug testing in the trucking industry, some tractor trailer drivers are continuing to use illicit drugs. And it's having a potential, you know, hazard, you know, a negative effect to their driving ability. So again, this, this study really illustrated that urine is, is okay, but the world's evolving around it. So let's look at the alternate specimens. So again, ultimate specimens were developed and were really developed by the industry to basically go, hey, you know, urine isn't working in a lot of cases. Let's look at other specimens that are, you know, easy to collect and transport, cheap to test, accurate, adequate detection window, and impossible to spurt. Let's look at these. And the industry basically formulated two. One is oral fluid. So when you look at oral fluid, it is easy to collect. It's essentially watching someone swab the inside of their mouth for two minutes. You know, it is relatively cheap to test, and it's especially cheap to test because you don't need a collection site, that these specimens can be collected easily by an employer, the chain of custody can be initiated there, and it, it, again, you eliminate that collector, and right now the majority of the testing costs for anybody who has a urine program is the collection. The collection is the majority of that, that cost. It's ac accurate. So accrediting uh, bodies came through and, and, and certified how the labs are testing this, and it's deemed accurate. The detection window, it's small. You know, the detection window here is only a few days, and it's actually less than 24 hours for marijuana. But the lab that was pushing through for the FDA clearance actually showed that they had as high or higher percent positive rates in their selection of people than, laboratory, than the laboratory urine programs. And therefore, it was deemed that even though the detection window is smaller, taking out the ability to subvert the test actually gave a potentially is at least as good as urine or potentially better. And again, it's very hard to subvert, it's impossible to subvert. Yes, you know, it's really hard to all of a sudden, you know, stick an oxidizing substance in your mouth before you do a swab and have that oxidizing substance still in your mouth because those type of substances don't really work well against your cheek and gums and cause a great deal of irritation and bleeding. So again, they're not routinely used at all. And if they were used, it's just not a real world situation. When we look at hair in the same light, hair is relatively easy to collect. 
However, you do need a trained collector. Depending upon the laboratory partner being used, the amount of specimen is actually somewhat different. There, there's some labs that you need, you know, a, the amount that's about as big as the uh, tip of a ballpoint pen. Uh, other labs need uh, a amount of specimen that's about as big as the ballpoint pen. And therefore, even though both of those specimens are relatively small, one is still somewhat smaller, but you do need a trained collector so that you don't have someone who, who gets a buzz cut just to give a hair specimen for a, an employment test. Cheap to test? You know, again, that's a no because it is relatively more expensive to test hair than it is urine or oral fluid. Hair is a much more complicated specimen just because of everybody's hair is a little bit different, how they have to process it, weigh it, and digest it into a liquid phase. That varies between the different laboratories that test hair. So it is a, a more complex specimen to test and therefore a, a higher cost test. It is accurate. And the detection window is arguably the best. I mean, or it, 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 we, it's known to be the longest. So hair grows out at a uniform rate of about a half an inch every 30 days. The drug testing laboratories actually just test the first inch and a half of hair. Therefore, you get, you know, about a 90-day detection window. So again, the longest detection window and therefore arguably the best, you know, the, the best window of detection. However, if, if I did cocaine tonight and I hadn't done cocaine for the last 90 days and I come into work tomorrow impaired and you try to do a hair test for reasonable suspicion, guess what? I may be high, I may have used cocaine the last month, but I'm not going to be positive because it takes a week to 10 days for it to grow out from, you know, from your scalp out for an area that they can actually cut it, so break the skin. So again, the detection window is great for uh, a pre-employment test, but really doesn't have a great utility for testing uh, in the arena of either reasonable suspicion or post-accident because you really want to look at temporal relationship to use. And again, it's very hard to subvert. There are all sorts of shampoos and things that claim that it, it can break up the hair and, 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 so to speak, remove drug from the hair. I haven't seen any of them work exceptionally well. So again, compared to the urine a subversion market, this, this market is really impossible to subvert. So when you look at oral fluid, you know, that's like one of the devices here up in the upper right-hand corner is really a device that's used to collect the oral fluid. Um, it, it has outstanding temporal relationship to use because really oral fluid is considered an analog or being the same as what's in the blood at the time. It's not easily subverted, and it's very easily collected by an employer without a huge icky factor. So it's not like collecting urine and having a urine cup on your desk. It's something that the donor actually collects from themselves, puts in the, the vial, gets sealed in front of them, shipped off. Again, it does have a higher cost if you have to get a collection network. It actually has a lesser cost if you self-collect it. But it does have the smallest detection window, and that's particularly important for marijuana, so here's a guy smoking a, a marijuana cigarette, the detection window is under 24 hours because what oral fluid testing is doing at this point in time is looking for the contamination of C8, THC on the oral membrane. So it's not getting from the blood onto the oral fluid like the other drugs. It's actually the contamination of smoking or eating marijuana. When we go into hair testing here, again, long detection window. One of the nice things about hair testing is it has the highest donor fear factor. That's why there's many companies out there in the transportation arena that are mandated to do urine that also do hair because they want to assure a drug-free workplace knowing that the, their urine program can be gamed or subverted. And once they place that we do hair testing on their recruiting websites, uh, their applicant pool diminishes. They get less applicants. However, the applicant 
applicants that they do get are actually the applicants they actually want to see and the ones that they ideally want to onboard. It's arguably the best test for cocaine. So when I talked about the people stealing from the job site and such, a lot of times those are people that are, are uh, cocaine users. It seems to be a cocaine-driven event due to the cost of that particular illicit drug. Uh, so therefore, in, in Las Vegas, the reason all the casinos that are really, you know, really concerned of people stealing chips or money from the casino, guess what? They all hair, hair test. So they're using that because cocaine, or, or, you know, hair testing is arguably the best test for cocaine. However, the weaknesses is it's a relatively much higher cost test. There's no real you know, temporal relationship to use. Therefore, in a lot of states, um, you know, for workman comp purposes, if you want to use the drug screen to kind of refute that workman comp claim, you have to have some temporal relation to use between the positive drug screen and the accident. Well, hair test is never going to give you that. Um, and again, it's a poor, relatively poor specimen to detect marijuana. Certainly, I see a lot of hair test specimens positive for marijuana. For it to get into the hair in a level that the lab detects it, generally someone's a routine user and not a very sporadic user. And then you also have to talk about the, the bald man issue. So the people who are follicularly challenged, you need to have something in place within your policy to say, what if the person has no hair? What do I do then? So those are just some considerations that you need to use for hair testing. So the approximate cost here, I just threw up some approximate costs that are across our client base here. They have urine testing in about the $35 range, oral fluid testing about $29, hair testing at about $85. And then, you know, this was 2012 data where I tracked this because I manage well over one and a half million drug screens a year. Uh, so therefore, at this point in my life, you know, the majority of those are urine tests, the vast majority of them. So at this point in my life, I can say my lifestyle is purely predicated upon urine. But that being said, two and a half percent of them were positive in urine, four and a half for oral fluid and six and a half for hair. So when you use those numbers and lay atop that the $11,000 per year that you can save your organization by detecting and removing or rehabilitating that drug user, that, you know, this is a bit of an eye chart, but you'll see that your relative costs for urine, oral fluid, and hair are down here at 35000 29000 and 85000 So again, much bigger number in hair c compared to urine or oral fluid, but the relative savings that you get are much higher going up per specimen. So when you have a 2.5% positive rate, you're saving you know, your organization just under $300,000. In oral fluid, it's just under you know, half a million. And with hair, you're up over seven, you know, 700000 So again, big jump up here, and again, uh, relatively small step downs due to cost. So the specimen selection. So now I'm going from, hey, that's just general information. What I want to do now is go, hey, how is this important to me? So when we look at this, please acknowledge that every drug-free workplace program needs to be structured upon deterrence and not absolute detection. However, to foster an environment of deterrence, you do have to collect people. You do have to get, you know, uh, detect people and have positives. So what you're ideally trying to do is get the one apple, bad apple, from ruining the whole bushel. So, again, even though deterrence is the goal, de 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 detection is key to foster that environment. So, again, you know, if donors can study for the test, the effectiveness of deterrence is minimal. So, again, you know, methods of studying are delaying the collection. So, hey, I just don't want to go get this done right now. I have something to do. Can I go get it next week? So you're onboarding someone and you give them a long window, of the, a long window to go get their urine drug screen collected. Well, all of a sudden, you really, that's a method of studying for the test. That person, you know, is if they just stop using drugs, within a week it's going to be negative. So therefore, they're guaranteeing a negative drug screen. The next one's the dil you know, dilution. Let's dilute out that specimen. So let me put a lot of water in my mouth and not, you know, not have my mouth devoid of any fluids when I stick the 
the swab in there, so then it absorbs and it dilutes out the drug on, on, you know, within the oral fluid. Or you use, you know, drink large amounts of water and you're going to the collection site, you can actually dilute out that urine. So specimen subversion in regards to substitution, adulteration, or tampering, again, as we talked about, it, it's significant for urine, and there are products out there that can try to do that for hair as well. And then the no specimen, you know, I can't, you know, I can't urinate or I don't have, you know, I don't have hair. Both of those things need to be addressed in your policy and how you handle the person that is follicularly challenged or the person that does have end stage, uh, you know, end stage renal disease, so is on dialysis and doesn't urinate. How do you handle that in regards to your policy? So again, the factors that really affect specimen choice, there's four of them. The first one is risk tolerance. So every time I talk to a client and go, hey, what's your risk tolerance? Everybody says it's high. But within that high, there's gradations. There's people that will spend a lot of extra money to, to be ultimately risk, you know, don't, they don't have any tolerance for risk. So they're willing to spend incrementally more dollars to, so to speak, detect and have higher hit rates because their risk tolerance is very, very, very low. Where there's other people whose risk tolerance is, is, is contained by some cost parameters and what they consider is reasonable. There's the drug-free workplace program. So what does your incumbent employee program do? Do you just do a pre-employment test and then you never test the person for drugs thereafter unless you have reasonable suspicion? Or do you have a robust employee screening program that can be used as a deterrent point for using drugs? You have your onboarding practices. So how do you bring people on? There's some companies that, you know, are bringing on warehouse workers or bringing on factory workers, and those people, they get it. They have a very small background requirements, and they have contact with the donor up front, and therefore contact with the donor up front. It's very easy for them to collect the specimen right there at their warehouse or factory. Whereas you have other companies that dynamically onboard people, so they're coming from all over the country, and the hiring manager may never see the person until their first day of work. And again, you know, cost, you know, cost is something that everybody looks at. You know, do, where do we spend our money? Do we spend our money to have you know, less risk tolerance, or do we spend our money elsewhere? So when we start looking at this, really your organization will have to, you know, since everybody's resources are limited, unless you're the federal government and you can just print more money when you need it, everybody has a budget and they're limited. So what you need to do is look at the money you have to spend, look at where, where it is, and then assign where you want to, so to speak, spend your money and use your screening dollars. So if I look at scenario number one, which is kind of a urine client profile, transportation cli clients are you know, risk averse, but they do tolerate some risk within their area because they're very cost sensitive. Uh, transportation clients a lot of times are working on margins far less than 10%, so, you know, cost is king here. They have very robust drug screening programs in place. Uh, you know, the minimum DOT requires a transportation client in the random program is 25%. Federal motor carrier requires 50% per year. And their onboarding practices a lot of time is there's very minimal delay, that people are applying, coming in, and giving specimens in a very rapid time frame. So again, urine is still a good choice for the typical transportation client. There's some transportation clients that are out there that go, yeah, I got to do urine. Yeah, it's okay, but you know what? I really want to foster a drug-free environment. And they may layer something on top of this, such as a hair test. But again, for a lot of our typical transportation client, urine is still effective. The next client scenario, again, from a, a, a manufacturing facility, factories, plants, those type of things, they have, you know, again, medium risk tolerance. Many of them have very robust drug-free workplace programs in place, so they do do a lot of uh, incumbent employee testing and random programs and, and such. They are cost-sensitive, 
And the onboarding practices, like I said before, they have intimate donor contact, so that person may be in front of them. They may then say, yes, I want to hire you the job, and, and to come aboard, you need to have a negative drug screen. They can collect it right there and don't have to lose the person. Also in this environment, oral fluids very attractive because you're running a plant. These people are working on an assembly line or doing something, uh, and all of a sudden, you don't want to lose part of your workforce to go send them to a collection site to get a random drug screen done where that person may be gone for hours and then coming back. An oral fluid test is very easily collected there uh, at the facility and there's minimum lost time, generally much less than five minutes um, to t do the whole process to collect the specimen and initiate the chain of custody. So these people will only be away from their job site for 15 minutes rather than hours. And the next typical client is what I call kind of our white collar, you know, clients. We have these white collar clients that spend extraordinary amount of money in their pre in their pre employment screening program, looking at a bunch of different ways to screen their people to avoid risk. Uh, and they because they have very low risk tolerance. From a cost perspective, a lot of these clients, it's, it's cost neutral. If, you, if they see a hit rate can increase by so much, they're very willing, you know, willing and able to pay that in, uh, additional screening dollars because they generally don't have drug-free workplace programs in place. They may have a drug-free workplace program saying we support having a drug-free workplace, but they really don't have any means or structure in which to do random testing or other testing on their job site. So essentially the pre-employment drug screen, if they're using urine and they may have a delayed onboarding practice, so a person knows they're in that pipeline for a while, that pre-employment drug screen becomes more of an IQ check than it does actually uh, a check for you know, uh, drug abuse. So again, that, that typical white collar client falls much more into the hair testing arena than it does with the other two specimens. And lastly, you know, my real recommendation. You know, look at other, I'm not going to read the slide to you here, just look at other, you know, specimens. If your drug screening program stuck in the 90s that you haven't looked at the alternate uh, technologies, it's always a good thing to do. Look at them, what's available, how can you harness them. You know, make sure you get a consultant in place. So I know we have higher right clients on the phone and some that aren't. You know, from a higher right, you know, client perspective, you know, my team of people are very willing and able to talk to you about your screening program, what your risk tolerance is, what your drug-free workplace program is, how much things cost, you know, and, and how you onboard people to give you, you know, information to either improve the use of your existing specimen or potentially harness the use of other specimens. For people who are out there that are potentially prospects of us or are getting this for informational purposes, again, that's the type of consultative support that my team you know, provides our client base. And again, when you look for a consultant, look for someone that can talk to you about all the different specimens. You know, uh, we may have some vendors on the phone, and again, uh, you know, I'm vendor agnostic. I, I love all of our vendors, and I hate all of them. You know, each one of them has strengths and weaknesses that we harness to use. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of the, the wording, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks at a nail. So make sure you get a consultant that can really harness everything within the industry and not just one particular program because guess what? Everybody's needs out there are individual and unique and you need someone to help you configure that program that works for how you onboard, how you run your program, what happens, and all of those things are very important. So, Heather, I think I'm turning it over to you for the, the, the uh, question and answer period. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Simo. That was a great presentation and we do have a lot of questions, but if you haven't had a chance to um, and ask your question, you may do so now via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. The first question is, if you were to recommend an ideal drug-free workplace program, what would it be? No, certainly. So if I looked at my ideal, and I actually had a webinar just over a year ago where I kind of looked at the ideal program, 
The ideal program to me would encompass a, a pre-placement test or a pre-employment test along with a, a random drug screening program of, of some sizable percentage. Now, it certainly doesn't have to be the size of, of a, a motor carrier program of 50%, but I look at something in the 20% range uh, uh, per year or so of your you know, covered employees. Um, I would also have a post-accident, so something that would trigger a testing event if there was an accident or injury, as well as reasonable suspicion testing. Um, you know, if I would look at then specimens for that, I'm a huge advocate of hair as the specimen of choice for pre-placement, pre-employment testing. It gives you that long detection window, it gives you that very high donor fear factor, and it really allows you to vet that person. It's, it's almost the same as saying, hey, I want to do a criminal felony misdemeanor check that goes back seven years, whereas urine and oral fluid, I want a criminal felony misdemeanor check that goes back six months. So, you know, there's a relative that that longer length of time actually gives you a, a better detection window and a better deterrence effect. Once I get into the incumbent employee testing arena, so for random or post-accident reasonable suspicion, depending upon you know, how much contact you have with your given employees, I would utilize either urine or oral fluid in those situations because you have something that has uh, a, relation, a much closer relationship to use. Uh, you can also then then look you know, look at it that if you do have a a facility and all your people doing randoms are at that facility, it's very easy for you to do you know oral fluid drug screening. However, if you have a, a you know facilities and you don't have management staff throughout all the facilities that can act as a collector, well then urine makes more sense where you can all of a sudden use urine to fulfill those tests. Great. Um, from an MRO perspective. How do you view legalized marijuana in Colorado? No, certainly. So Colorado is one of the states that I, 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 I you know, call smoke them if you got them states. So Colorado, Washington, and soon to be Oregon and uh, Alaska all have decriminalized marijuana. So marijuana is not legal anywhere. It is still a federally illegal drug, a DEA class one drug, which means it's illegal to possess, sell, use, prescribe. So, but from that perspective, Colorado and those other states have t taken upon themselves to say, hey, in this state, if you buy it from a state-sponsored dispensary where we're going to get tax dollars from, that we're willing for you to have small amounts for personal use. Um, you know, from an MRO perspective, uh, that's still when you all of a sudden say, hey, I smoke pot because I live in Colorado or I vacationed in Denver, um, that's still admitting illicit use from a federal perspective. And the state laws, you know, employment laws in those four states have actually been very pro-employer in your ability to say, hey, because they all had uh, medical marijuana statutes in place. So someone with a horrific medical condition could get a doctor to recommend the use of marijuana for them. All of those states had that type of program. And even if you had a horrible medical problem that, you know, required you to smoke marijuana for a, a to alleviate the symptoms, you still weren't protected under employment law there. So an employer could say, hey, I understand you're doing that, but guess what? It's still illegal from a federal perspective. It still causes an intrinsic risk to us as the employer. Therefore, we don't have to use it. So from an MRO perspective, if you say, hey, I smoked it because I was in Denver, we, we verify it as a positive drug screen. You as an employer in those states, I encourage you to, to continue using that positive drug screen in the way that your drug-free workplace program is written today, which means if you don't hire them or don't offer any kind of accommodation or anything, continue doing what you're doing, and that, that decriminalization shouldn't affect it. Great. Um, do, you have, do any of the specimens allow you to make a determination of impairment? No, certainly. And, and one of the impairment things is what I get asked a lot. I do a lot of testimony uh, for, for our you know, client base uh, over the year, and I get asked by attorneys all the time, well, can you tell us if the person was impaired? You know, uh, hair testing you can't do at all because hair testing, guess what? The window of detection is seven days from, you know, from time of collection out to 90 days. So all I could say is that from seven days out to three months, the person would use drugs sometime within that period of time. So there's no temporal relationship of use with hair. When you go to urine, 
you know, urine's a repository of metabolite over, you know, over a long, you know, over a, a you know, several day period of time, and therefore I can't really make a determination of uh, impairment at the time. I can say that within the last, you know, three days the person used drugs, and that could have been an impairing effect due to studies, but I'm really not able to definitively say impairment. Now, oral fluid since for the majority of the drugs other than marijuana there is some sort of uh te you know it's an analog of serum so therefore the higher the level the more the drug is, is in the system you can draw some uh conclusions about potential impairment and even with marijuana since you're looking at it as a contaminant that contaminant there's actually known you know kind of known how it leaves your you know leaves that mucous membrane so very very high levels in the 20s and such actually mean use very you know within a window where it's still impairing so you can make some judgments on impairment using oral fluid they're certainly not as, as strong as, as blood testing, but again, you can, make, you can draw some conclusions from oral fluid that you can't do with the other two specimens. Um, continuing on with oral fluid testing, can you describe a company profile that would be using oral fluid testing? Yeah, certainly. So the company profile that I look at, at using oral fluid testing, a lot of, uh, are those companies that have uh, intimate donor contact. And when I say intimate donor contact, it's, one, it's companies that have management staffs in place that, that, that have their employees there within a building, a plant environment or something, and have, you know, on the onboarding practice, the hiring manager sits across from the applicant and does the interview and then says, hey, I would, you know, I think I'm going to move forward with hiring you. I'd like to get a drug screen. You know, you know, if you pass the drug screen, we'll move, move through to hiring. Um, so they have that type of contact as well as those kind of plant environments or, you know, where everybody's there, a random list comes out. You can then go, okay, I need to pull these 10 people. You don't have to send those 10 people then off to a collection site for hours that you can actually pull those 10 people and get the testing done right there at the facility and send them back to work. So again, I think it's an ideal testing uh, for companies that, that have plants or those type of facilities um, that can have train collectors there and, and have that type of donor contact. Great. Um, this will be the last question. Can employers conduct a urine test on site and get instant results? Employers can collect urine tests on site and get instant results. There are FDA approved and cleared point of collection uh, testing uh, that are out there and available. So that is something that is avail you know, available to employers um, that are willing to learn how to collect urine. And, and because it's not just as simple as giving the guy a cup and say go pee, you know, pee in it because there's some parameters in regards to filling out potential chain of custody, you know, and learning how to actually do some initial specimen validity checks so that the person isn't gaming the system. So there's some things that are embedded within that process that those employers need to be willing to take on. But if they're willing to take them on, there's several good devices out there that can give you very similar lab, um, you know, lab non-negative rates. It just acknowledge that all of those point of collection testing, if they are preliminarily positive or non-negative on site, all need to be sealed and sent to a, a approved laboratory for confirmation testing. Because there are several drugs out there that uh, cause, in this arena, false positive. So this is the one time I can say a false positive, because there's an antidepressant that will cause on-site tests to be falsely positive for PCP, even though that, that, uh, that antidepressant isn't any chemically even related to PCP, but it does fool that test. When it goes to the lab for confirmation testing, it doesn't fool the lab's equipment, and you'll ultimately get a negative result. There's also HIV medicines that cause the marijuana screen to be positive that aren't marijuana. So there are some false positives in that arena. So if you are doing point of collection testing, um, make sure that you have a laboratory to back it up because it's just with the laboratory result that then makes that result actionable and defendable. 
Great. Thank you. So that's our last question. Thank you so much for spending an hour of your valuable time with us. Tomorrow you will receive an email with a link to the on-demand version of the webinar and um, the information to claim your HRCI recertification credits. Um, you'll also have access to the slides as well. Thank you for attending this event. As always, if you require additional information, please contact us at 800-400-2761 or visit us at higherright.com. Thank you. Thank you.